Hi, another extreme teardown of a bit of slightly unusual kit today, courtesy of eBay. This is an MSA 5 star gas detector. It's um, basically it's a personal alarm for people that work in areas that might be subjected to toxic or flammable gases, places like sewers, chemical works, that sort of thing. Um, because of the sort of nature of the device, it's yeah, obviously a very safety related device and can be used in flammable atmospheres. There's a few specific design features specific to that, that area, um, which are quite interesting to look at some of the details of. Um, one of the first things you s notice on the back, there's all these funny symbols, um, E, X and various letters and numbers that look a bit like hier hieroglyphics. There's a number of standards and design methods for equipment that may be used in areas that could have flammable or explosive atmospheres, places like petrochemical plants, mines, sewers and various other places. Um, one of the most common is called intrinsic safety and this is basically a set of design rules um, designed that under, even under fault conditions a piece of equipment can't produce a spark to ignite the atmosphere. Um, intrinsic safety is mainly about limiting currents, segregating different parts of the circuitry, creepage and clearance distances so that under pretty much any conceivable fault condition this thing is not going to set things on fire. And it's not just electrical, there's some mechanical aspects, for example this um, this has actually got a silvered uh, metallic coating over the plastic and that's going to be to, to avoid static. So obviously static's a major um, risk of producing sparks. So um, in that sort of area, you know, all the materials everything's made of is quite important. One of the other things you notice are things like battery packs. Um, one of the things the standard says is you can't remove the battery without the use of a tool because obviously taking out a battery in a hazardous area could be, could be dangerous. So this has actually got um, an Allen, a captive Allen key that you have to unscrew in order to get the battery, or, the battery off. And obviously the battery won't, won't actually latch in until, until, you do, until you do up that screw. So again, it's preventing access to these potentially dangerous terminals. If you took that out, short it out, you get a spark and boom, not, not good. Not good. Another little safety feature is these little lumps next to the sound cavity. Um, that's purely so that if something covers up this area, it's quite difficult to actually seal up these holes and stop it making a noise. So if somebody's jacket sort of was leaning over there or anything, it will, it will tend to keep stuff off of it. And again, it's recessed and you've got these ridges on the side. So if it's up against the surface, you've always got that gap for the sound to get out. Right, this thing's a modular device and it can be configured to, to detect a number of different gases. So there's these electrochemical sensors that plug in. Um, so this can take up to five different uh, sensors. The ones in here are hydrogen sulfide, oxygen concentration and carbon monoxide. But you can also get detectors for specific gases um, and also flammable gases. And so these are little modules. There's a little PCB on the bottom. Uh, that's going to be a little E-squared prom that's got information about the sensor, what type of sensor it is, probably some calibration information, there might also be lifetime information. These are all chemical devices, so I'd imagine they've probably got a fairly finite life, so they're, sort of, they're smart sensors. And the way these connect, there's actually pads on the PCB, and in between there's a little elastomeric connector. These are very similar to the connectors they use on um, certain types of LCD. Basically it's like a rubber, rubber like material with metallic strips so it's conductive in this direction but not in that direction because they're individual strips and when it's compressed it means that you get good, good, good contact and the, the, the rubber provides the, the, the sort of springiness you need to maintain a connection and those just go down onto the um, those sets of pads on the PCB. It's a very rugged feeling device, it feels extremely solid, obviously this thing is designed to be used in very rough environments, but also part of the intrinsic safety spec and actually specifies certain impact tests and it must survive those tests without anything, you know, it broke the case breaking which again could, uh, could affect safety so the idea is you know, if you drop it it's not going to disintegrate and in fact that's actually one of the reasons um, why you're not supposed to use cell phones near petrol pumps. It's nothing to do with the RF, it's the fact that they're not intrinsically safe so you could could, for example drop it and the battery could short and produce a spark. This, this is your is a NICAD rechargeable battery and the other thing you'll notice is this is completely potted. Again this is to do with the intrinsic safety. Um, it's to make sure that there's no way um, that if gas gets inside here, let's say an internal battery short couldn't cause an internal spike and ignite the gas and where, wherever you've got a high power level that you can't limit um, generally you find that potting is one solution. A common technique also is because you sometimes have to use re resistors to limit the amount of current below what the standard says you're allowed to have in terms of the risk of a short circuit, you sometimes find battery packs with internal resistors and because those resistors cause, can cause a problem for your circuitry 
uh, one technique is to actually have multiple resistors, so you've got one battery pack that provides several separate supplies, each with its own resistors. Um, this one doesn't actually do that, but that, that is a common technique, and it's um, something that's been done in a, a design I worked on for uh, quite a few years ago. But this battery is completely flat, I, I figured out um, what the terminals were. Just a general rule, if you've got a completely unknown piece of kit and trying to figure out what the, the, the terminals are, the first, th first thing is to find ground, so you can, just, you can usually find something that's clearly earth, obviously this has got a metalised casing, so the whole thing's earth, so you can do continuity between earth and find out which pins are earthed. So I found two pins that were connected to the ground, there were another two pins that were connected to each other, so obviously those have been doubled up for the current capability, just that, that told me which were the plus and minus on this battery, which was so flat there was no voltage at all, so I managed to just hook this up to a power supply and give it enough charge to get this thing um, fired up. Now if you notice it's got this green seal around the outside now I don't know whether the green is just a sort of a corporate colour thing or whether maybe it's more functional if it's a bright green then it's very obvious if it's broken or damaged so I think that might be a, another safety feature so if the seal's knackered um, you can actually see it so you actually check you know part of the safety check is to make sure you've got this nice clean green line all the way around particularly also if you're opening it up and you put it back together again and the seal gets trapped and it's not, not in properly so I'm guessing that may well be a, an a, additional safety feature. Right, let's fire this thing up and have a quick play with it. Now, first thing you notice it's got a very very loud beeper on it so again it could be used in noisy environments and if there's if there's danger shut up if there's dangerous gases around you really want to know about it and also it's got these bright bright red lights on it. Right, um, it's noticed I've pulled the oxygen sensor out because that was the oxygen sensor was giving me a continuous alarm so I've just taken that out um, it's noticed that the sensor configuration has changed. Notice there's part of the display has disappeared, which is maybe one of the reasons why this was junk. This is actually quite an old kit, a piece of kit, so I think it's well out of support and warranty. You probably can't get the sensors for it anymore. Um, so it's asking me, do I want to reset the sensor? So it's important that it will. It tells you if it suddenly sees a different sensor configuration, because it may be one the sensor's gone faulty. So you, you need to be told that something's changed, because again, it's you know lives could depend on having those sensors. Um, so it's just, it's just li it's listing what sensors it's, see it, it's seeing in there. It'll show all the different alarm levels, the different concentrations of gas. Finally, I couldn't actually figure out how you set those. I don't know if those are maybe preset in the sensors, the actual thresholds of um, what constitutes an alarm. So it's now doing a self-test. Right, it's now seeing fresh air set up. I think what this is basically is zeroing the sensors. So you take it to a place that you know the air is clean. Um, and then you say go and then that sensors a baseline level for all the sensors so I think because these are chemical sensors they're probably a little bit unstable there's actually I've looked through the manual online and there's a, a calibration thing it's like a clip that goes on there and you get reference gas bottles and give it certain known concentrations and it recommends doing that pretty much every shift so these sensors are clearly not super stable they need calibrating very frequently um, right so this is now in its running mode it's saying there's no hydrogen sulfide and there's no carbon monoxide in the atmosphere which I'm quite happy about. Right so I've got my portable gas soldering irons. Hydrocarbon gases when they burn they'll generally they produce a certain amount of carbon monoxide as well because they're in complete combustion so uh, let's fire this up. We should actually be able to produce some carbon monoxide. So let's see what happens if I just point this out so you can see the readings there. That occasional bleep, that's just a, um, the monitor, it just bleeps continuously, periodically, just to remind you that it's still switched on. So again, you know, lives could depend on this thing working, so if it suddenly stopped working and you didn't know about it, that's yeah, it's giving like a positive, yes I'm still here, yes I'm still here, sort of um, indication. So let's just squirt a bit of the exhaust gas near the sensors. Oh, there we go, straight into alarm, it's showing 400 ppm. Can silence the alarm temporarily so it's I'll blow the gas out and although you can sil sil silence the alarm it doesn't let you permanently silence it will just keep going into alarm so you can see it's the levels dropping down now as, as the gas is clearing out the sensor 26 now it's now below the alarm threshold um, I can't immediately think of a way of generating some hydrogen sulfide so I won't bother testing that one You can see the green seal here. Um, there's a, the beeper in the, um, the lid. Now, actually, that's actually mounted in a sound cavity, and that's a 
a sort of fairly acoustically designed cavity which makes a massive difference to the uh, level of sound you get out and obviously this is designed to fire straight upwards as well because obviously if on a thing that's like a belt worn thing you're going to want to concentrate the sound outwards outwards and for such a, a little sounder like that this thing is very very loud flex cable here take that out insulating sheet So we've got this top PCB here, let's take a look at this. Here's this PCB, the first thing you notice it's got quite heavy conformal coating on it, it's probably, you just about see the shininess there. Um, this is just to protect against moisture, um, so if you do get some moisture going past the seal it's not going to screw things up. Um, these gas sensors work at pretty low levels, looking through the specs on some, it's like a few, you know, one or two microamps for the full scale readings. There's quite a lot of low level analog stuff, there's op amps, um, precision resistors and stuff on there, so this is pretty much all analog um, stuff on the back here. Flip it on the other side, a few more interesting things. One thing here is the pressure sensor. So I'm guessing there's maybe some calibration on the sensor depending on ambient, the ambient pressure. One thing I was a bit surprised is this unit didn't seem to have any sort of air sampling pump, but there is actually an add-on that clips onto it for applications where you actually want to flow the gas through the sensors. There is actually an option for that, so I'm not sure whether this sensor is going to be to do with detecting the pre pressure caused by that flow or some sort of calibration factor on the sensors dependent on ambient pressure. I'm not really sure about that. You've got the main processor here, that's a 68L11, I think it's a low power version of the 68HC11 with an external 27LV010, not sure if that's an EEPROM or a non volatile E squared. Dates around the year 2000 or so. There's a few features on here related to the intrinsic safety. Um, one is you see these very big resistors here. Now, there's, in fact, here there's, these two are actually connected in series. <clears throat> there's two reasons for their size. One is to maintain um, enough clearance across it. The standards specify how much clearance there needs to be for you to consider the fact that there's no risk of them failing too short. The whole point, is, point of the thing is that under fault conditions it's safe and they actually define very specifically what things correspond to what sort of fault and there are certain conditions they regard as being infallible um, and that means certain amounts of clearances. The other issue is that any component on which safety depends has to be only used within I think it's either 50 or 75 percent of its nominal rating. It's a while since I read the standard so I can't remember but the idea is that you're running any safety related components well below the specification. Um, the other thing you see there's quite a few fuses. Um, there's one there, one here, one here, there's another one here. This one actually looks like it's potted as well. These aren't fuses you'd expect to blow in normal operation. The point of these is to limit the amount of current. Um, it's not really function, it's more about the ability to prove in your documentation that, you c that the thing is safe. So the standard specifies um, certain amounts of power that can be dissipated to produce a, cer a certain surface temperature because there's, there's two potential ignition sources. One is a spark and the other is surface temperature. So if you've got one component getting very hot, um, the, the T4 on the that label specifies the maximum surface temperature and there are various other categorizations. Uh, T4 is the most common, there are uh, more stringent specs, T5 and T6, which I believe are used for particularly dangerous gases, things like acetylene and I think hydrogen as well, that have a much lower ignition point. But so the point of these fuses is to say you can say that the area of circuitry protected by that fuse, the spec says that you assume that what the current flowing in that circuit is 1.7 times the fuse rating. So the idea is that you ha have to show that when you've got 1.7 times the fuse rating flowing in that circuit, the power dissipation and temperature can't exceed a certain amount. So that's the reason for all these fuses. Yeah, you, these will never actually blow. These are more about being able to prove it's safe rather than actual functional safety itself. The spark issue, um, that's generally has a by, um, controlled by limiting voltage. The standards specify maximum values for capacitance at a certain voltage. They actually have a table saying at a certain voltage you're allowed this amount of capacitance. And yet again there'll be, um, there's quite a lot of Zener diodes, there's quite a lot of Mark D, there's there's, for example here there's two parallel Zener diodes here right next to this capacitor. I'm guessing those are actually probably controlling the maximum voltage that can appear across that capacitor. Um, well, there's also standards for maximum inductance, For example, because if you get an inductor 
passing a certain amount of current and that inductor goes open circuit that can, can potentially produce a back EMF which can produce a spark or it can couple high voltage into the rest of the circuit. I I'm not totally sure why they've used two, two different types of fuse. It could be that this has just got a unusually low or high value so the idea is of course a fuse could potentially cause a hazard if it blows in its normal way so sometimes you see fuses that are potted um, to avoid that risk. So you also see there's quite a lot of these large diodes and for example here that you can see there in, there's two groups in parallel and that's about redundancy. There are different classifications to how many faults the thing can suffer and still be safe and that's actually partly down to what atmosphere it's used in. Um, so for example for equipment that's designed for use in atmospheres which are where the very high likelihood of there being explosive gas present a lot of the time you actually have to use equipment certified to a higher standard so basically if you average out the the risk from the atmosphere and the risk based on the circuitry you get a, a, a constant so for situations where hazardous gas isn't normally expected to be present but might be uh, you don't you have to have let you, you don't need quite such a high degree of protection in the device itself because um, it's quite common to use triplicated diodes under certain categories, but they're only using duplicate. There's also a significant difference is between the standards used in the US and the um, Europe and the UK, but say it's quite a few years since I've been involved with that, so those have pr probably changed and are different. But the, the basic principles are the same. It's, it's really about limiting current, limiting surface temperature, and actually being able to, to show in your documentation that, that you know, there is no conceivable fault that can um, result in a high current or a high uh, a spark condition and the approval process is very expensive a lot of it is about some guy sitting looking through the circuit trying to figure out all the things that, that can go wrong and you quite often find that you actually add components just to segregate circuit to simplify the problem yeah it doesn't actually improve the safety but it improves the ability to prove that it's safe so if you can separate all the different parts of the circuitry and show that each individual one's safe you don't have to worry too much about the interactions between those uh, bits of circuitry so it's, it's quite a challenging bit of design um, design exercise and very expensive but so it's, it's quite an interesting process so after that little diversion into intrinsic safety um, there's not really much else of interest on here but let's take a look at the rest of it so this backboard which is the board that the sensors plug into so this will all be sort of stuff like signal conditioning for the sensors this is the board that the um, sensors plug into so on this side you've just got the uh, these nice chunky connectors that the pins of the sensor go into the pads for the E squared prom um, <clears throat> again you've got conformal coating this has been selectively coated because obviously you don't want to get coating on these connectors but you'll see, you can probably just make out they're just blobs and coating around here and Quick fact about conformal coating. Um, this is this stuff's obviously been um, brushed on manually, but it's more normally sprayed on. And because it, the purpose of it is to protect your circuits, you, it's quite good to know that you haven't got any gaps in the spray. So almost all conf conformal coating to help the inspection process, they actually put a fluorescent dye in it. So if you expose it to UV light, you can see it glows. So that's a very quick way of inspecting a conformal coated board, particularly if it's sprayed. Another reason for the coating, again, it, back to the intrinsic safety side of things, is that the, the required creepage distance, uh, distances are less if the board's conformal coated. And again here we've got, there's another fuse here, another couple of diodes connected together. Um, the rest of this board is like analog processing, there's an ATD converter, lots of stuff from linear tech and analog devices on here. Um, so low level amplifiers, there's a, multi, uh, a multiplexer for switching the signals between the, um, the sensors and on this side again more analog, analog stuff all over the place and again lots of these chunky diodes, big resistors for the uh, intrinsic safety. And this flex goes up to the display board. There's a, a little flex here, that's for the, um, the membrane keypad for the uh, buttons. So this is just an LCD, there's a interesting little box there, I wonder what's in that. Uh, well the other thing, there's a, an infrared transmit receive pair that goes through the side, so that's obviously a data link um, to provide probably data logging, maybe some calibration and test functionality on there. Something I've just noticed on this display board, every single pin of the LCD has two diodes on it. Now again, this is another intrinsic safety feature. Because this is a graphic LCD, chances are this has got a moderately high supply voltage, it could be maybe 10, 12 volts. Um, because the energy of a spark is proportional to the square of a voltage, 
um, the amount, for example, of capacitance you're allowed to have drops off very dramatically as voltage increases. What's happening here is that you've got this high voltage going into the display somewhere. It's probably going onto this one that's got the single zener. And of course you could have a short or something in the display that means that high voltage comes back out into your logic circuitry, which may have high value capacitors on it. So if you didn't have these diodes, you'd have the risk of your high LCD voltage finding its way back to the low voltage areas into say a 100 microfarad capacitor and that could produce a very serious spark risk but obviously if it over voltages the capacitor in particular if it's a tantalum capacitor um, but just the fact you've got that higher voltage you've then got a spark hazard so the way this will have been done is the LCD will be regarded as a separate segregated circuit and these all these diodes here provide a barrier between that high voltage area high voltage area and the low voltage area of the rest of the uh, system um, I'm guessing this this box here is a DC to DC converter to produce the LCD supply and this is probably in its own little potted enclosure because again there's sometimes where you may have you may have to put a high current through an inductor higher than the spec says so the only way to make that safe is to put it into a potted enclosure and include um, resistive and maybe diode protection at the boundary of that enclosure so that because it's potted you can't get explosive gas inside here to explode and the protection means that by the time it gets to the pins on the outside it's no longer hazardous so I mean, some, some intrinsic safety equipment you'll find there's quite a lot of little potted assemblies and potted enclosures because it's actually quite an easy way to um, ensure safety. Well, on the back of this display board again you've got another fuse, more big resistors, more protection diodes again. A lot of this is going to be to protect the high voltage coming out of that DC to DC converter. One of the other reasons for the big resistors, um, not just to limit the current itself, but also if you're relying on a Zener for your safety, you have to make sure that you can't overload that Zener via any normal current or reverse current. So sometimes you also find resistors being used to limit the maximum possible current into a Zener barrier. Let's have a look at these sensors. Um, a few warnings. Sealed unit contains caustic, causes severe burns, can be fatal if swallowed, so I better remember not to eat it. Sealed unit contains acid, causes severe burns, can be fatal if swallowed. So, don't eat the sensors, folks. I've just taken the PCB off the back, and there's a couple of little leads going through, going to the sensor marked RT1. Uh, this is almost certainly a temperature sensor because, as these are chemical devices, I'm sure their output is going to be highly dependent on ambient temperature. And again, there might be some temperature calibration factors in that E squared. sort of micro plastic disc with little holes in it that could be to regulate the amount of gas that goes in. It looks like some sort of soft membrane here. I did look up a patent number that was on one of the other sensors, but all that was really describing was the um, the way they seal these pins. But it looks like the whole thing's just a stack of loads of different layers of material. Right. Not sure if that top bit's an electrode or just a membrane. Oh, so like a plastic layer with something on it. Signs of moisture now. Yeah, this is actually quite wet inside. That's one of the electrodes going through. Right, that's getting wet. I'll stop using my nice surface mount tweezers. What else is going on in here? Oh, I've got some layers of, sort of paper-like material with some 
got some liquid embedded in it. Oh, this looks interesting. So this looks like sort of some sort of sintered metal. It's like sort of a very porous looks fairly metallic. I can't have any clue how these things work. It's clearly some sort of chemical reaction process that produces some sort of output current. It's looking fairly solid. Don't really fancy drilling this stuff out. Don't really know what it is. No, it looks like this is just full of this stuff, so I uh, don't think I'm going to go any further on that with this one. Let's see if this carbon monoxide one's any different. It's a bit smaller than the oxygen one. PCB off. Yeah, the PCB on this one's just E squared. <coughs> just some sort of filter over the top there. And then just four little holes. Looks like this is assembled from the back. So we've got some liquid coming out now. I can't really see anything interesting in there. This looks like a plastic cell with like a sort of porous membrane on the top going into this chemical liquid filled pot. Soak some of this liquid away. Yeah, some very wet layers of tissue-like material. A little disc of something black and a white thing. Another one. So yeah, some more electrodes down here. And then we've got what I'm guessing is just a reservoir for the liquid. Yeah, that's where the liquid was, and there's like a looks like a little filling hole. So, quite a lot of. Well, it says acid on the side. I'll take their word for it. I'm not going to taste it to test. Ugh, bloody batteries, duff.